Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Aristotle's Poetics. In this video, we are looking at what is Deus Ex Machina. Now, Deus Ex Machina means God from the machine in Latin. However, the origin of the phrase can be traced back to Aristotle's Poetics, specifically to his critique of the practice in the Poetics. Now, Originally, the phrase was a literal description of something that would occur physically on the stage where, near the end of a production, an actor would enter the stage dressed as a god, riding a machine of sorts. Sometimes this might be a crane that made them appear to fly, it could be a trapdoor that made them appear from underneath the set, etc. Once again, with Aristotle's theme of documenting tropes that existed throughout theater, this was one of them, of the trope of someone who is dressed as a god showing up on a machine. God from the machine. Now, this entrance of a god was often used to resolve an otherwise unresolvable issue in the plot. In modern times, the phrase is generally used when something outside of the plot comes in to resolve an issue or fix a problem. It's often looked down upon as contrived or shoehorned in. Aristotle was generally a critic of spectacle on simply the grounds that spectacle is bad, thinking that the an audience's emotions should be driven by the plot and the relationships between the characters, not by the simple spectacle of, ooh, look at the pretty fireworks. However, his criticism of the common practice of deus ex machina was similar to the modern criticism. It wasn't drawn from his simple distaste for spectacle. It was an action arising from something outside the plot, and therefore it was not part of the quote-unquote unity of action. It also was irrational, and Aristotle was at least aware, if not actively combating, Plato's critiques of the theater as something that was irrational. And so Aristotle, wanting to try to defend the theater as best as he could against his teacher, was saying that, ooh, let's get rid of these things that seem irrational, they're not part of the main action of the story because it's a god coming from outside the story fixing the story, which should be central. Um, and it's in some way rational. And on top of that, it's basically just spectacle, and he doesn't like spectacle to begin with. So he has a lot of reasons for disliking this. Um, however, Aristotle did not deride the practice altogether. He claimed that these elements and forces external to the plot could be used in prologues or epilogues, which makes sense with his idea of kind of the very strict adherence to unity of action, focusing on a single action. You probably need a prologue and an epilogue to tell the rest of a broad story, and so pulling in things external to the plot to do that could make sense. These events were necessarily external to the main action of the play because he has that very strict focus on the unity of action, and so could be portrayed as being caused by forces outside of the play, such as gods coming from machines. In modern thought, the criticism has been made a little bit more specific. The, the conclusion is much the same. The problem is not solely that the event is coming from outside the scope of the plot, but rather that it is beneficial to the protagonists. Random events that make things worse are generally not looked down upon, but random events that fix all the problems, I don't know, eagles saving you from a mountainside of a volcano, generally are looked down on. For example, Pixar's 22 Rules of Storytelling, quote-unquote, states this concern quite concisely, saying that coincidences that get characters into trouble are great, but coincidences that get them out is cheating. The reason that this may be seen as a little bit different to what Aristotle was talking about is because Aristotle's conceptions of kind of protagonists and antagonists, good guys and bad guys and villains and heroes, looked a little bit different than our current conceptions, given that things have been flopped on their heads with tragic figures, at least in some ways, taking on the roles of villains as opposed to the central character of the play, as it was in Aristotle's case. So something getting you into or out of trouble didn't have the same meaning necessarily. And so all of the things that were external to the plot were problematic for Aristotle. For more on those distinctions, check out the video earlier in the series on the tragic figure. Whew. Thank you for joining us for this long, long series on Aristotle's poetics. Hopefully it was helpful for anyone who is learning about Aristotle, learning about the poetics. I would encourage you, there's a lot of primary texts that are really hard to get through and are really dense and long and painful. Aristotle's poetics, if you haven't read it, check it out. It is short. It is comparatively easy to read. And hopefully with this short series of videos, 
you will, or series of short videos, perhaps a long series, but short videos, um, it'll give you a better sense of what's going on here. Watch this video and more here at carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.